We continue Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough, by starting with Marcellus. They say that Marcus Claudius, who was five times the consul of the Romans, was the son of Marcus, and that he was the first of his family called Marcellus, that is, Marshall, as Pasitianus affirms, he was indeed by long experience skillful in the art of war, of a strong body, valiant of hand, and by natural inclinations inclined to war. The high temper and heat he showed conspicuously in battle, in other respects, he was modest and obliging, and so far studious of Greek learning and discipline as to honor and admire those that excelled in it though he did not himself attain a proficiency in them equal to his desire by reason of his employments. For, if ever there were any men whom, as Homer says, heaven, from their first youth unto their utmost age, appointed the laborious wars to wage, certainly they were the chief Romans of that time, who in their youth had war with the Carthaginians in Sicily, in their middle age with the Gauls, in the defense of Italy itself, and at last, when now grown of old, struggled again with Hannibal and the Carthaginians, and wanted in their latest years what is granted to most men, exception from military toils, their rank, and their great qualities, still making them to be called upon to undertake the command Archelaus, ignorant and unskillful of no kind of fighting in single combat, surprised himself. He never declined a challenge and never accepted without killing his challenger. In Sicily he protected and saved his brother, Atticilius, when surrounded in battle and slew the enemies that pressed upon him, for which act he was by the generals, while he was yet but young presented with crowns and other honorable rewards, and his good qualities more and more displaying themselves. He was created. Curule. Adil. By the people, and by the high priest's augur, which is that priesthood, to which chiefly the law assigns the observation of auguries in his adilship. A certain mischance brought him to the necessity of bringing an impeachment into the Senate. He had a son named Marcus, of great beauty, in the flower of his age, and no less admired for the goodness of his character. This youth, Capitulinus, a bold and ill-mannered man, Marcellus's colleague, sought to abuse. The boy at first himself repelled him, but when the other again persecuted him, told his father, Marcellus, highly indignant, accused the man in the Senate, where he, having appealed to the tribunes of the people, endeavored by various shifts and exceptions to elude the impeachment, and when the tr tribunes refused their protection by flat denial, rejected the charge, and there was no witness of the fact, the Senate brought, the Senate thought fit to call the youth himself before them, unwitnessing, whose blushes and tears and shame mixed with the highest indignation, seeking no further evidence of the crime, they condemned Capitolinus and set a fine upon him of the money which, of Marcellus's cause, silver vessels for libation be made, for which he dedicated what they considered to be gods and goddesses. Now, whether it's an attempt or a full-on, you know, rape of anybody of any age. A fine is not enough. Imprisonment is not enough. And I'm not calling for vigilante action, you know. Um, we don't want to have people go to prison for doing what the government should be doing, but you know, um, after the, the cat, that was one of the problems with the Catholic Church, is you can do anything and pay a financial penance. Well, I mean, at some times and places. And, yeah. 
After the end of the first Punic War, which lasted one and twenty years, the seed of Gallic tumults sprang up and began again to trouble Rome. The Insubrians, a people inhabiting the subalpine region of Italy, strong in their own forces raised from, among the other Gauls, aids of mercenary soldiers called Gasata, and it was a sort of miracle and special good fortune for Rome that the Gallic War was not coincident with the Punic, but that the Gauls had, with fidelity, stood quiet as spectators, while the Punic War continued as though they had been under engagement to await and attack the victors. You know, that China is doing that right now, right? And now, only were at liberty to come forward. Still, the position itself and the ancient renown of the Gauls struck no little fear out of the minds of the Romans, who were about to undertake a war so near home and upon their own borders, and regard the Gauls because they had once taken their city with more apprehension than any people, as is apparent from the enactment which with, which from that time forth provided that the high priests should enjoy an exemption from all military duty except only in Gallic insurrections. The great preparations also made by the Romans for war for it is not reported that the people of Rome ever had at one time so many legions in arms, either before or since, and their extraordinary sacrifices were plain arguments of their fear. For though they were most averse to barbarous and cruel rites, and entertained more than any nation the same pious and reverent sentiments of the entities with the Greeks, yet, when this war was coming upon them, they then, for some prophecies in the Sibyl's books, put alive underground a pair of Greeks, one male, the other female, and likewise two Gauls, one of each sex, in the market called the Beast Market, continuing even to this day, to offer to these Greeks and Gauls certain ceremonial observances in the month of November. Are they talking about uh, Samhain, you know, a week into... Uh, what we call November now, because, um, you know, the cross quarter night and all that. Um, in the beginning of this war, in which the Romans sometimes obtained remarkable victories, sometimes were shamefully beaten, nothing was done toward the determination of the contest until Flaminius, uh, Flaminius and Furius, being consuls, led large forces against the Insubrians. At the time of their departure, the river that runs through the country of Picanum was seen flowing with blood. There was a report that three moons had once been at Ariminum, and in the consular assembly, the augurs declared that the consuls had been unduly and inauspiciously, inauspiciously created. The senate therefore immediately sent letters to the camp, recalling the consuls to Rome with all possible speed and commanding them to forbear from acting against the enemies and to abdicate the consulship on the first opportunity. These letters being brought to Flaminius. He deferred to open them all, having defeated and put to flight the enemy's forces. He wasted and ravaged their bodies. The people, therefore, did not go forth to meet him when he returned with huge spoils. Nay, because he had not instantly obeyed the command in the letters by which he was recalled, but slightly and condemned them. They were very near denying him the honor of a triumph. Nor was the triumph sooner passed than they disposed him with his colleague from the magistracy, and reduced them to the state of private citizens, so much were all things at Rome made to depend upon religion. 
they would not allow any contempt of the omens and the ancient rites, even though attended with the highest success, thinking it to be of more importance to the public safety that the magistrates should reverence the entities than that they should overcome their enemies. Thus, Tiberius Sempronius, whom, for his probity and virtue, the citizens highly esteemed, created Scipio Nasica and Caius Marcius consuls to succeed him, and, when they were gone into their provinces, lit upon books concerning the religious observances, where he found something he had not known before, which was this. When the consul took his auspices, he sat without the city in a house or tent hired for that occasion. But if it happened that he, for any urgent cause, returned into the city without having yet seen any certain signs, he was obliged to leave that first building or tent, and to seek another to repeat the survey form. Tiberius, it appeared, in ignorance of this, had twice used the same building before announcing the news. Uh, announcing the new consul. This edge ends up being in the shadow too much. Um, now, understanding his error, he refused. Uh, he referred the matter to the Senate. Nor did the Senate neglect this minute fault, but soon wrote expressively of it to Scipio, Nasica, Nicaeus, Marcius, who, leaving their provinces and without delay returning to Rome, laid down their magistracy. This happened at a later period, about the same time, too. The priesthood was taken away from two men of very great honor, Cornelius, Cathegus, and Quintus, Sulpicius, from the former, because he had not rightly held out the entrails of a beast slain for sacrifice, from the latter, because while he was immolating the tuft cap, which the Flemings wear, had fallen from his head, Minicius, the dictator who had already named Caius Flaminius, master of the horse, they disposed from his command because the squeak of a mouse was heard and put others into their places. And yet notwithstanding, by observing so anxiously these little niceties, they did not run into any superstition because they never varied from nor exceeded the observances of their ancestors. Um, not everything passed on is something that you should observe, but I wanted that just build up over time. One of the main reasons why people don't follow religion is because people made it too strict. It's like Islam has five rules of what not to eat. It has, you know, not not too difficult of clothing rules and stuff, but people made all sorts of, oh, you, you know, um, and it varies which part of the world you're at. It's like, oh, you don't wear yellow. Um, you don't wear, um, blue as a man. Or you, it's like, wh where does it say that? It says some other stuff, sure, but, um, but people make things way too strict, like, um, not everybody can, uh, but uh, anyways, um, there's examples from all sorts of paths. Um, so soon as Clemenius, with his colleague, had resigned the consulate, Marcellus was declared consul, but the presiding officers called Interrexes, and entering into the magistracy, chose Cnaeus Cornelius, his colleague. There was a report that the Gauls proposing a pacification, and the Senate also inclining to peace. Marcellus inflamed the people to war, but a peace appears to have been agreed upon, which the Gassata broke, who, by passing the Alps, stirred up the Insubrians, they being 30,000 in number, and the Insubrians more numerous by far, and proud of their strength, marched directly to Akera, a city seated on the north of the river Po. From thence, Pritomartus, king of the Gassata, taking with him 10,000 soldiers, harassed the country round about. News of which being brought to Marcellus, leaving his colleagues at Akerra with the foot and all the heavy arms and a third part of the horse, and carrying with him the rest of the horse and 600 light-armed foot, marching night and day without ammunition, 
he stayed not till he came up to these ten thousand near a Gaulish village called Crestidium, which not long before had been reduced under Roman jurisdiction. Nor had he time to refresh his soldiers or to give them rest, for the barbarians that were then present immediately observed his reproach and condemned them because he had very few foot with him, and by barbarians they mean they didn't speak their language or maybe they didn't even know what their language was. Um, the Gauls were singularly skillful in horsemanship and thought to excel in it, and as at the present they also exceeded Marcellus in number, they made no account of him. They, therefore, with their king at their head, instantly charged upon him, as if they would trample him under their horse's feet, threatening all kinds of cruelties. Marcellus, because of his men being few, they, that they might not be encompassed and charged about on all sides by the enemy, extended his wings of 